All right, first thing I want to kick off with this morning, important news, happy birthday to Ben Espiner, producer uh, of my slot here on uh, the platform. Ben, uh, ripe old age of, I'm allowed to tell Ben, it's not embarrassing for you yet like it is for me. Ben is 22 years old today. Um, not a great birthday for him, though. Left a gaping hole at 7 o'clock in the programme. Um, I'm really pissed off with him. Maybe his last day at the platform. No, I'm joking, Ben. We'll keep you on till next week. I've got to give a notice period. Um, so happy birthday to you, Ben. All right, what am I going to do um, that we haven't got an interview? Well, that is great because it gives me a chance to have a good old-fashioned Sean Plunkett rant about some stories that have driven me absolutely up the wall. Let's start. Let's start with page three of the Dominion Post this morning. Stuff's capital flagship um, woke newspaper. Page three of Stuff Today, National Party rules out Tamaki. And you would have heard all over legacy media or mainstream media, I I'm think I'm now going to call it legacy media, all across legacy media yesterday, millennial political reporters and commentators were all obsessed by the idea of Luxon saying, I might do a deal with a political party that doesn't exist yet, that's Freedoms New Zealand, which currently has the Tamakis and a Wellington millionaire called Michael Yacom in it and isn't even a registered political party. But the most important thing that the taxpayer-supported members of the press gallery and legacy media could do in the last couple of days was run round speculating on whether um, Christopher Luxon, who they all inherently philosophically hate and want to do down, whether or not he was going to do a deal with Brian Tamaki. Well, A, it's one of the most ridiculous questions to be obsessed about for a reporter. Because, firstly, Freedom New Zealand doesn't actually, in real terms, exist yet. Even if it did, it's not in Parliament yet. And there, it's got a snowball's chance in hell, forgive me, Bishop Tamaki, it's got a snowball's chance in hell of even getting to 2% in the polls. Uh, the Outdoors New Zealand Party, run by Sue Gray, that doesn't want anything to do with it. So the whole thing's dead in the water when it begins. But what your legacy media reporters and editors saw was a chance to try and paint Christopher Luxon as some sort of religious nutter or extremist by associating him or even raising the suggestion that he'd be associated uh, with Brian Tamaki and anything to do with him and, and politics. And of course, um, the media then go around creating a story, a story that never existed. Now, of course, the National Party has now ruled out Tamaki, um, but that's given people like Grant Robinson, whose government, of course, funds many of the journalists running the silly story, it gives them a chance to say, oh, look at the National Party, look how nutty they are, look at, they'll, they'll lie down with fascists and Nazis, et cetera, et cetera. So a completely um, fallacious story uh, that never was going to happen, never had any reality to it, but just as an indication of how legacy media journalists and editors are constantly looking to support their friends on the left of politics and do down their friends on the right of politics. Uh, Chris Luxon, I have to say to you, you need to sharpen your act up, mate, and know when you're being set up by a hostile media like this. You should have been ready for that question, and you should have had a smarter answer, and the answer should have run something like this. Um, the National Party, uh, what the National Party is concentrating on now is connecting with New Zealanders and creating for them a new government that delivers what they need and what they've been missing uh, under the last two terms under Labor. You don't even mention Brian Tamaki. You don't get into the religion thing. You just concentrate and say what you want your message to be. I see Nicola Willis, who's had a bloody good week, I have to say. Deputy Leader Nicola Willis in the Stuff article is kind of cleaning up Luxon's mess and says, no, this is silly. It's what you should have done in the first place. And, of course, Nicola Willis picked the mood of the nation right on that KiwiSaver GST flip-flop, didn't she? And came out of it very, very well. But despite that, despite that actually being, in some ways, one of the bigger political stories of the week, what does stuff want to talk about? Oh, they want to basically smear by association the National Party 
because that's what they do. They are not impartial, impartial journalists. And talking of impartiality, oh no, let's have a break. I need a, I need a little bit of a breath in between outraged raves. John, now watch the loony media um, say Luxon is undemocratic by refusing to work with small parties. Yeah, um, I don't think Luxon's got it. Luxon thinks. And I said this to a friend the other day, what Luxon's trying to do is offer a bigger dollop of vanilla ice cream to middle New Zealand than Labor does. Um, but I think he's still under the misapprehension that smiling and waving is going to turn around a hostile left-wing media. And it just ain't. You've got to wake up and smell the roses and you've got to be more proactive and smarter than you are in dealing um, with the legacy media. Now, another story that outfits like RNZ and stuff are covering at great length is one of the most disturbing developments in our democracy, not the most disturbing, one of the most disturbing I, am, I have ever seen. Local Government New Zealand is kind of like the umbrella organisation for councils and local bodies. They, I am presuming, pay their fees into it. it I'm not sure if it's statutory, but it basically gets them together and organises their conference and sort of represents them. And in what is a highly stupid and naive and uh, if not politically bent, local government New Zealand has launched what it calls a voter edu campaign, uh, education campaign that it says is designed to improve democracy, encourage people to vote, and make sure our system of local government and local government elections works. Well, that's all complete fallacy. What they have done is they have launched an attack on candidates who they believe to be politically incorrect and politically unsound. And in the world of the woke beltway, that means anyone associated with being anti-mandate, anti-vax, associated with Voices for Freedom, or not a member of the Labour or Green parties. That's fundamentally who local government New Zealand, what is meant to be an apolitical lobbying body, they have decided to pay a group of people called Fact Aotearoa, who are fundamentally, from what we have seen, just a website, but they're a bunch of lefty academics who are running around like the very secret of disinformation project screaming Nazi and pointing the finger at anyone who they disagree with. I cannot believe that local government New Zealand is trying to dress up this piece of political interference in our democratic process as some sort of voter education campaign. Um, and even the headlines give the lie to that claim. RNZ's headline, LGNZ launches voter education campaign as conspiracists and extremists stand for election. You know something, last time I looked, you're allowed to have extreme views. You can have them on the left, the right, the top, the bottom, the flip side, the front side. It's not illegal to be extreme in your views. It isn't even necessarily bad. And one person's extreme is another person's moderate. What is important is that we have freedom of thought within the boundaries of not doing physical harm to others or inciting lawlessness or harm. So I think this is part of what is clearly now a softly coordinated campaign uh, with questionable funding streams to basically deplatform, cancel and witch hunt anyone who does not follow uh, left-wing orthodoxies from standing to or being successful at local body elections. Personally, I have more faith in the average Kiwi. I have more faith that they can see a racist a mile off, they can see a lunatic a mile off, and I guess I've also got to have faith that they can see bent tax or ratepayer funded propaganda a mile off as well. We asked local government New Zealand onto the program this morning. We gave them plenty of time to talk about a program they're happy to go and talk to the legacy media about. 
and Radio New Zealand and give advance warning of their wonderful campaign. And guess what? They're busy today. They've got an all-day conference. Well, I'm sure it didn't start at 7 o'clock, local government New Zealand. So what I'm, what I'm thinking is you haven't got the guts to front up and ask, answer some real questions from a real journalist who isn't politically and philosophically aligned with your woke agenda. We've also tried to get hold of Fact New Zealand. Uh, they haven't even answered us, Fact New Zealand, and tried to get through to someone from Fact New Zealand. Oh, but they also seem to be linked up with the Disinformation Project. You know, the Disinformation Project that is constantly calling for transparency and openness from political candidates it doesn't like, but will not front on this show or answer any meaningful questions about where they actually get their money from and who they report to. So while we have the thought police in the form of local government New Zealand, Fact New Zealand, the Disinformation Project, while we have the thought police trying to play with your mind, try to limit the choices you have come local government polling day, um, we are being kept entirely in the dark about their agenda. Unless you are with them, you are against them. So that is a huge threat to our government, um, or our, sorry, our way of electing governments. And local government New Zealand should hang its head in shame for getting into such a proper, uh, such a work of propaganda. Fact New Zealand, if anyone associated with Fact New Zealand, whoever you are, and I suspect you're a bunch of left-wing academics from Massey University, anyone associated with Fact, can you tell me who pays your bills? Can you tell me who created you? Can me, you tell me what your hidden political agenda is? Because it looks like it's just get rid of people whose politics we do not agree with. And I find it remarkable that local government New Zealand, which has been around for a while, teams up with such a dodgy organisation and tries to influence and change the way that people vote. And make no mistake, folks, there is a concerted campaign by legacy media, people associated with the current government and with the left wing of politics to disenfranchise and shame out of running for office people who it, they politically disagree with. And there can be no doubt that is happening right now. But the legacy media aren't going to tell you that. They have all drunk the let's go hunting Nazis Kool-Aid. What is the political story you won't read about in legacy media? What is the story that raises uh, the biggest concerns about the way this country operates? Well, lo and behold, it's a story that we're following here on the platform. It is the story of RV Yemeni. The, well, right-wing blogger, social media person, he says reporter from Australia, who was denied entry to go to the Brian Tamaki rally. We raised this issue with the Prime Minister on Friday and here was her position. The decision to reject Mr Yemeni on character grounds was entirely an independent decision made by solely by Immigration New Zealand. And he was turned around because he was a bad character. OK, I'll buy that. I'll buy that. I'll buy that, despite the fact that immigration has declined this week to um, deport a 51-year-old Fijian man who lost it at his wife and held a knife to her throat and has other convictions for violent offenders. But no, no, he's allowed to stay in the country. His character is OK, right? Even though he's not a New Zealand citizen. But Avi Yemeni, not so much. So he turns up, presumably, um, to catch his flight... Um, to New Zealand and the Qantas people say your passport's been flagged and you can't come in because of your character and that's it. And you'll have to apply for a waiver. Uh, Prime Minister says government's got nothing to do with that. That was purely an operational decision by Immigration New Zealand. And we started asking questions of Immigration New Zealand and they seem to be confused about the grounds as to which they um, made that decision on Mr Yemeni's character. Uh, they say, well, it's because of his character, and then they can't point out what it is about his character they don't like. And then they say it's because of his criminal convictions, but on the policies that they're meant to work by, his criminal convictions simply do not warrant denying him entry to New Zealand because he has not been incarcerated for a period of a year. They've now come back and said it's any violence of offence. Well, that's just not so. Plenty of people with violent offences 
come to New Zealand. And indeed, as I've just pointed out to you, there's a 51-year-old Fijian man in Auckland who held a knife to his wife's throat and assaulted her, and he's not being deported. Okay? So, no. No, that doesn't wash. So we put a bit of pressure on uh, Immigration New Zealand. We have asked them, under the Official Information Act, for the tape recording made of the phone conversation between Mr Yemeni and the immigration official who denied him entry to uh, the country. Um, we've gone back and we have, well, we've now done, what, three, four rounds, Ben? Four rounds with um, immigration, four rounds of back and forth. Um, but what we did get out of Immigration New Zealand yesterday was that perhaps um, they did not, as the Prime Minister told me to my face, perhaps they didn't make this decision alone. Because this week we had a leaked memo on a right-wing uh, blog site or news site called the BFD, which purported to be from Interpol Wellington, who were writing to Interpol in Australia saying, basically, and I paraphrase, have you got any dirt on this guy, Avi Yemeni? We don't want him in the country and we've read some nasty things about him online or in the media. So could you please find some dirt on him? Now, I questioned the veracity of that email. It seemed to support the idea of political or police interference in Mr Yemeni's free movement. Um, it seemed too perfect. Uh, so I left my judgment on that out. But the funny thing was, yesterday we get communication from Immigration New Zealand, who, realising they're now in, in hot water, flick the responsibility for this back to the police. And they say their decision to reject Mr Yemeni was based on information received from, you get it, Interpol, the New Zealand police. So that leaves us with the question. Do we have immigration rules and policies that are equally applied to all citizens? Or are the New Zealand police somehow, through some secret method, sitting there and deciding who is politically acceptable to come and visit this country. Who is directing the police? On what information are they basing the fact that they do not want Avi Yemeni in this country? And until we know that, we have a real problem. We have the beginnings of a secret police state where you can be disappeared and non-personed with no right of appeal and no understanding as to what has been done to you. Uh, I say to the New Zealand police again, could you please tell us what was it that alerted you to Avi Yemeni? There is the possibility he's on some sort of paranoid Nazi hunting um, list with the SIS or with the government. But at the moment as things stand, I could not hold my hand to my heart, my newly recovered heart, and say so we've got an uncorrupt and straight up immigration system and that people, New Zealanders or otherwise, are not being targeted for special and unusual negative treatment because of their perceived political views or their so-called political incorrectness. And you can see how this story links into what I've been talking about previously, which is local governments, New Zealand's thoroughly corrupt and partisan uh, campaign to out shame and deplatform certain candidates in local body elections. A campaign clearly being supported by legacy and mainstream and government funded uh, news media. So I say the Avi Yemeni story isn't over. That doesn't mean I necessarily like Avi Yemeni, that I think he really is a journalist or that he's not a difficult dickhead. Uh, but it's our system of government, it's our system of laws and it's our principles that I am most concerned about and it would seem to me on the information we have available at present, they are being severely, severely compromised. Uh, but you won't read about that, you won't read about that and we'll loop back to the beginning of this, this rather long rave. You're not going to read about that in mainstream media. They are too busy trying to put the boot into Chris Luxon they are too busy trying to put the boot into Brian Tamaki. They are too busy think it, uh, thinking that they can tell you what to think. I challenge in, any member of mainstream or, mega, uh, or, or legacy media to take a good look at the events surrounding Avi Yemeni, 
Put aside your distaste at having to recognise there are people with different political views than you in the world, perhaps do your bloody job and write some real stories. I think that would be a fantastic, fantastic idea if you actually did your job properly. Um, Sean, um, and I've got some text here which I'll read. This is from Debbie. Well done for your efforts to find the truth re- regarding Avi Yemeni. Please keep going until we find out the truth. Um, fact, New Zealand is just a couple of socially inept leftists with, the, with their hair, with blue hair, living in mum's basement, getting their thrills at targeting the types of people they hated at school. Find out who they are. Well, the funny thing is that local government New Zealand have teamed up with Fact New Zealand. Oh, it must be Fact Aotearoa because they're that sort of people. They've teamed up with them. They've given them all sorts of credence and presumably some money. So we need to find out from local government New Zealand who haven't got the balls to front on this program this morning who Fact New Zealand are and why we appoint them as our thought police. It's the same as the disinformation project who will not front, who accuse others of hiding their agenda and not being open with the public, where the disinformation project um, and its lefty researchers only front for journalists they know will never ask them a decent question and will never hold their feet to the fire or put them to the test. There's Marae for the morning.